My name is Cheryl Stenstrom, uh, and along with Drs. Susan Allman and Deborah Hicks, um, I co-chair the Leadership and Management Advisory Committee at San Jose State University's iSchool. Uh, we have a number of, of advisory committees at the iSchool, but uh, this one is very active. Uh, and so following a successful four-part webinar series on leadership uh, that we presented last spring, the members of that advisory committee recommended that we continue to present uh, featured guests at least once a year. So this is the fifth uh, in our Day in the Life of a Leader webinar series. Uh, you can find recordings of the previous four webinars um, on the iSchool's website, and uh, this session is also being recorded, and I see that the recording has just been turned on, so uh, you can refer your colleagues to it after the fact as well. I'd like to quickly move on and introduce our guest. Um, Tamika Barnes is with us today, and she came to us very highly recommended as someone who could speak to what it means to be an effective leader. So we're really thrilled that she's agreed to uh, do this for us. She's the department head for uh, Perimeter Library Services at Georgia uh, State University. And that's a position that oversees the work of five libraries on the campuses in the Metro Atlantic Atlanta area, pardon me. She was previously the library director at Georgia Perimeter College at uh, Dunwoody campus. Tamika has also worked in a variety of other library settings, including being the library director at the U.S. Environmental Pr Protection Agency, the head of reference at North Carolina A&T uh, State University, and the engineering services librarian at North Carolina State University. She received her MLS from NCCU and her BA in biology from uh, UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, she stays very active in the profession and has served in a variety of positions for uh, the Special Libraries Association, the North Carolina chapter of SLA, the American Library Association, and the North Carolina Library Association, um, as well as the Georgia Library Association uh, now that she's moved. And she's currently serving on the executive board for the ALA and is Georgia's ALA counselor. Um, so I would like to give uh, Tamika a very warm welcome uh, on behalf of uh, my colleagues and the whole committee. And uh, I will say that she is gonna speak for the first part of our hour together, and then we'll open the floor for questions when she's done giving her presentation. So welcome Tamika, I will turn it over to you and um, you can start sharing your desktop anytime you're ready. Thanks again um, for participating in today's webinar. Um, once again, my name is Tamika Barnes. I'm in the department head at Georgia State University for the Perimeter Library Services. So can you say that three times fast? I think each time I've moved up in positions, my title's gotten longer. <laughs> so, but um, what I want to talk about today is why I chose a leadership position, um, kind of my career path, um, responsibilities and challenges, some rewards and advice that I would share with those who want to uh, pursue this path in leadership. Um, and then also allow plenty of time for us to have a dialogue with each other just about this and any questions that you may have. Excuse me. Um, so to get started, um, because I want to make sure that we get through this, I want everyone has different reasons for moving into leadership. Some may say they, you know, enjoy being the, the go-to top person, um, the power. Some may say that they want to be honestly the financial benefits of it. And for some people, it's part of their plan from the beginning um, when they are entering library school. And for others, it's maybe like a slower um, traje trajectory in going into management. I would say that for, for me personally, um, it was one that I thought I would go into, but it happened a lot faster than I anticipated. Um, I would also say that I would probably went into it like some with a little bit of reservation about can I do this? Um, is this the right time for me to do it? And so forth. 
So I chose it once I did decide to go for it. I chose leadership because I wanted to make a difference. So I wanted to make a difference both to like the people that I work with and then also the users of the library. I was one that, you know, if I had opinions about how things may um, could work differently, then I wanted to be one where not just to give my suggestions to make things better and have them maybe considered, I wanted to actually be at the table and could influence change. I also saw leadership as part of being kind of an advocate for those that didn't currently have a voice at the table, whether that was for diversity issues, pay issues, or even services that we provided um, to our users and suggestions from them and from the staff. And that's just kind of, you know, a few things that I consider along the way. So I want to just kind of take you, those that, that know me know I'm like kind of the there's the theory and the case studies. I'm a case study type person. So I'm one that kind of want to walk you through. I did it as a case study. Like this is how I did it. This is um, one way, but kind of a way to kind of see if there's any ways that you can kind of relate to um, my, my path into leadership. So one thing I I want to say is that I didn't always start in a leadership position. So how I officially got there. Um, I began my library career as a paraprofessional at North Carolina State University in the acquisitions department. So I worked there full time while attending library school. And after receiving my degree, I became the engineering reference services librarian right there at North Carolina State University. So as the title hints, I was the subject specialist, um, one of two, who provided references and instruction for the College of Engineering. In that position, I um, also worked at the main library desk, providing reference services um, in person on the phone and via chat. Um, during that time, chat was like one of the newest things that we were doing and very busy. My time there, I worked at both the main library, the textiles branch library, which was actually located on a different campus, but within the same city, and then was relocated back to the main library after some organizational changes. And despite my physical location, I worked the general reference desk, like I said, and monitor chat. So I'm not sure about many of you on the call, but I've always been one to kind of look at job announcements and descriptions of what I thought my next job or my dream job would be. And as I was looking um, at positions that I thought I wanted to go into next, I saw that a lot of the supervisory positions wanted you to already have supervisory skills. Um, and so I was like, well, how am I supposed to do, this to do that? It was kind of like a catch-22 um, because the way our positions were structured in our library and lots of other libraries, there wasn't kind of that transitional step to get you those type skills um, within the organization. Um, so what I, I did is that I went to my um, assistant department head at the time and kind of told her, explained to her just kind of my career goals and that I was interested in supervising in the future um, and asked if I could shadow her and then assist her with supervising the library school graduate students that worked our reference desk um, mainly in the evenings and weekends. Um, she was amenable with and allowed me to assist um, at first just helping out with hiring so sitting in on the interviews helping develop the questions that we were going to ask and even in the decision making of who we were actually going to bring on 
She um, then later gave me the responsibility to organize the training for our new hires. And within a year, I was given the responsibility of supervising the graduate students full time. I would like to think it was because I was doing a really good job, but it was probably also um, honestly a, a win-win for both of us because although managing the graduate students was a highlight in her day, allowing me to do it gave her the time to work on more of the street strategic initiatives and programs um, and things like that that were required of her position. But it also helped me because it allowed me to get that kind of supervisory experience under my belt to help me get my next job. Um, so now I was in a leadership role, but did not necessarily have a title. And for me, that was okay because this was, like I said, my first go round at supervisory. Um, librarianship was my first career, so I, I didn't have like other experiences to bring into it. So I looked at this as a safe way to kind of develop my skills and still have the safety net of my assistant department right head right there to assist me um, when I needed to or give me guidance and feedback. So in this position, I was actually able to make some changes and help develop some future librarians, some of which I'm fortunate enough to still um, be in contact with today. And they are doing like awesome things. So, so this first experience allowed me to make my next move, surprisingly, into a department head position um, at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, which is located in Greensboro, North Carolina. In this position, I was able to supervise five librarians and a student workroom. So as you can imagine, it was very different um, experience supervising and having to support librarians versus graduate students. The needs are different in what they have, the requirements of them are different. And so um, that was kind of um, something I had to work through in that role. But here, using some past experiences that I had at NC State, I was able to kind of implement a curriculum integrated instruction program that was modeled from something that we had done at North Carolina State in the College of Engineering. So as in with lots of roles as we move into them, you know, you will find that you will reach back and use various experiences to build upon. And I feel like that first position was just laying what I feel was a very solid foundation for me to build on. From there, my next step in the career path was um, to the Envir Environmental Protection Agency as a contract employee. Um, and there I was considered the library director. And just a, a little bit of brief background with this type of position, the contract was actually um, under the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, their library school, and they had had um, the contract for a number of years, whereas other EPA location libraries are under more of a, a management company. So here I was able to supervise less librarians that I had at a &T, so I only had three, but now I was able to kind of add to my tools, um, supervising paraprofessionals and responsible for an internship program that had about seven to 10 library school students, depending on the year and the funding that we had. Um, and those library school students were able to work with us 20 hours a week, um, get tuition re, um, assistance, um, and also get paid. So it was like they were in a professional type environment and position, but um, you know, only had to work 20 hours a week. So this program really helped shape even more librarians um, out there into the future. And so um, it was a really 
sense of pride in, in the, the library there at the EPA, both for the contract workers who work there and then also the federal workers who have been working with us um, over the years. In that library, my responsibility kind of increased, even though I had less library staff, but I had um, male responsibilities for overseeing, you know, the traditional services of a library, which included reference and instruction, interlibrary loan, and now really the responsibility for um, providing print and electronic resources to the sciences there. In this position here, um, one of the things that I feel like I learned and kind of started advocating or using some of my advocacy skills, um, which I think is important in a leader, was to work with, when we got our contract renewed again, was to allow the hiring of library school students from the area library schools and not just from UNC um, who had the contract. And so that took some negotiation and some um, both between the federal side and uh, within the library school to figure out, you know, how we would get them paid and things like that. But I, I felt it was important to kind of open that experience up um, since in that area, there's a number of library schools um, just so that everybody had um, that kind of opportunity to, to um, participate in. So, but after five years of being in that contract position um, and going through one of the times that they had the furlough, nothing compared to what they recently went through, um, that and other things, I just decided that really I felt like I could be more effective in academia. And so I made the transition. So not only did I leave and come back to academia, but I moved to an entirely new state. Um, so I, I kind of left my, my close network and support system and just kind of went for it for a new role. Um, so my next job was the library director at um, the Dunwoody campus at Georgia Perimeter College, which is or was an associates or two-year degree granting institution. Um, so the way in this role, I increased the number of people I was responsible for and now led the Dunwoody campus, um, which had five librarians, three staff members, and a number of student workers. So still a relatively small staff that I was responsible for. And we, um, we service probably close to 9,000 students on this campus. But one of the things and kind of the transitional moment in my uh, leadership and professional career is that I was specifically told by my manager that I was hired to implement change. <laughs> so all those things that I've been reading about and learning about as far as being a leader, I was like, oh no, now I'm actually gonna have to put those things in practice and, and implement the change that he was expecting from me. So um, little did I know that was gonna be kind of, um, the initial beginning of some involvement with some major change management um, that was going to happen with our institution, which leads me to where I am now. Um, so as a department head of perimeter library services, now I oversee the five perimeter campuses that have a total of 16 librarians, 24 or so, give or take, full and part-time staff, it's always ebb and flow. I feel like every time I, I feel like we're gonna be 100% fully staffed, I get a new resignation, usually for um, promotional things. And so, you know, we want people to move and grow, but it's just like, oh no, we can never get at 100%. Um, and we also, 
employ student workers at our five campuses, um, and those numbers vary from semester to semester. One of the major challenges in moving into this role, um, which happened after our consolidation, and I'll tell you a little bit about that next, but we kind of operated our five libraries independently, and now we were being asked to operate as one department um, and me in this role. In our campuses, for those who aren't familiar, are geographically dispersed throughout Metro Atlanta. So the furthest campus is my Newton campus, which is a good hour away, mileage wise, not including Atlanta traffic. <laughs> so um, so kind of being over and supervising um, people in various uh, campuses can be a challenge. And, and I just feel like that's where um, one of the other things that I feel is very important with the leader is kind of communication in any way we can get it. So we, we are using WebEx and our phone and email and picking up the phone sometimes is just the easiest and fastest way to, to get things done. But also in this role, trying to make sure that now that we are one department and need to function that way, and follow like all the policies and procedures because our students also go from campus to campus. Sometimes they may take classes at our main campus, um, at our Dunwoody campus, and then the following semester take it at a neighboring campus. And so we just don't know. Um, so we wanna make sure that we are providing the same surface across the board. So as you can see, kind of moving through my career path and having these various titles, like sometimes the title doesn't necessarily dictate the level of responsibility that you may or may not have. So I have department head now, which is very different from when I was the department head at um, North Carolina A&T. So, so that's one thing I would say as you're kind of moving and looking at, at new roles and things like that, to just really have a good understanding about what it will entail, like what this position will have you do. I feel like looking back over my time in leadership positions that beginning it was really about the mechanics like almost like a checklist like how do I do this? like this is how I hire step one step two step three you know this is what I need to do um, learning about the best practices for scheduling and things like that um, using the systems to approve time cards that's like at every institution that I've been to it's always a little different um, and then really starting to understand more of the HR processes such as hiring um, and unfortunately sometimes terminating employees. And then I transitioned to being kind of responsible um, for the training of staff and um, whether that was me actually doing it or delegating and bringing in teams of people to help. Throughout, I've had some aspect of budget, um, whether it was just, you know, when I was at North Carolina State, where it was just my student budget and to make sure that we didn't go over or seeing if there were times that we could bring them in to do extra projects and things like that. So really having an understanding about how the budget worked, when the budget cycles were, because at each institution I've worked at, it's a little different. Um, and now my kind of budget responsibilities have increased and extended to past just the staff, but also including like resources, furniture, travel budgets, and allocating that. And how do you, you know, do that and be equitable um, so that all staff kind of have that um, 
opportunity to travel and things like that. And now more with the responsibilities, I see it more like transitioning more into the visionary. So before in my other positions, I can be like, oh, I wish we did this. And now it's like my expectation is that I will be that visionary and the person who's going to help with the goal setting for not just the individuals, but us as a department and how we fit into just kind of the strategic plan of the library as a whole and then also within the university. So of course, with all these various responsibilities that you have, and usually in addition to other job responsibilities, um, because it's not just a supervisor. In some cases, people are still, you know, working the reference desk um, and supervising or responsible for a program and supervising. I'm fortunate now that the majority of my um, time can be spent on the administrative aspects of things, but there's still other responsibilities that I um, have as well. And with all this, of course, there are some challenges. Um, so the making and communicating difficult decisions. Sometimes the decisions are made for you and you have to communicate them. Um, you may not always agree with them, but that's the decision that is made and must um, be followed through. Um, and then I would say some of the other challenges were like having to take disciplinary actions when necessary. Um, I had to kind of learn that. Um, sometimes it's easier to kind of just and I ignore it and hope that it fixes itself. But uh, as I've been in this position for, or in this role in librarianship for almost 20 years now, ignoring it doesn't really solve it. Um, and I've worked at places where it's kind of then me, the workplace, in some cases, almost toxic. And so you wanna kind of really have to deal with those, those things, whether they happened um, while you were there or you inherited situations coming in like I've had in some situations. However, um, it's just the situations that you have to deal with. One of the other things I also had to kind of learn and, and, and work through is that when I would initially set up meetings with um, staff, they would instantly go into panic mode and think something was wrong. And I was like, uh, no, I just kind of want to check in and see how you are doing, um, see how I can help you. I know you're working on a project. Um, and then later I found out that everybody hasn't had that experience with um, someone in leadership roles or management roles that were like that. And most of the time, their experience, their past experiences have been that the only time that they met with the supervisor was when something was wrong or when they were getting their evaluations. And so that was kind of a culture shift that I had to do here in my current situation. Um, I then also had it a lot of times my door is open, probably to my own detriment with my open door policy. But I had a part-time person at the time kind of come close and I was like, come in. And they were like, I've worked here at this institution for like, you know, five years at that point. And they had never been in the manager's office. And I was like, oh, so those are kind of the challenges, just kind of culture um, that sometimes you may have to deal with. Um, conflict management, whether that is, I would say, peer-to-peer uh, -peer or now in my case, dealing with supervisors and staff and just kind of working through that or even patron staff um, conflict management or, you know, faculty and how they may interact with my staff. Um, or just the expectations on both fronts and kind of managing that 
is one of those things that I really had to work on personally for myself. And then no mistakes are gonna happen. Sometimes we have to make um, decisions really quickly for whatever reason. And then sometimes we made a decision that we thought was the best at the time. And I feel like it's more about how you handle those missteps, that's important. Um, and then sometimes your external factors change, which, you know, will cause like what decision you make to seem like not the best one. The fortunate thing is a lot of times we can revisit and revise and move forward um, and just kind of making sure that if that's a mistake that I made or even my staff, I feel like as far as in this leadership role to be like, that's gonna happen and it's okay. I feel like if we're gonna be as innovative as we want to be, everything's not gonna work. And then that's why we have pilots and tests and things like that so that we can make the necessary changes. Um, and then I would say one of the, the challenges if it happens with you is that I have moved from a coworker peer-to-peer -to, -peer to then like a supervisor employee relationship with people, um, which can be kind of awkward for both parties involved. Um, but however, I feel like that's something that can be overcome with good communication and kind of sometimes in some cases, some, some boundaries that are set, you know, for things. Um, and then also now, just kind of side note type thing, um, my after hour invitations to places kind of diminished because, you know, nobody wants the boss around in case they want to talk about work. <laughs> so that was just one of the, the things where I'm like, oh, this isn't what I anticipated or expected, so. But with all of that, there is a silver lining and sunshine in all of this. And being in leadership allows you to actively direction with your department, your unit, your library, whatever it may be. Um, and, and that's rewarding. Um, to be able to recognize people's talents and strengths and assigning them, you know, tasks that kind of highlight those and gets them excited, excites me, right? Um, it's a very rewarding experience. And then as you're in these various leadership roles and you're able to develop your team, whether that means provide them the training that's necessary or hiring um, a person that kind of sees your vision and can move it forward is also a rewarding experience. And then also the implementing positive change. So not just change for change sites, but change that will benefit our users or something that they really requested and we were able to make it happen. So for instance, our students here um, at one of the campuses have been asking for extended hours for during finals since I got here five years ago. And we were finally able, um, to, with this consolidation and everything, able to do that for them for the first time. And they were truly appreciative of that because they realized that we were listening to them, um, but also that there were other things that we had to work through and we brought them in on that process and they really appreciated that. And that just comes also with building relationships across the organization. So really getting outside of the library. I feel um, as my leadership roles have expanded, it's kind of helped me and pushed me outside of the confines of the library building itself, um, which has been beneficial too, because we can be part of larger conversations within the organization. 
and there's things that we've been involved with whereas even a year or so ago I don't think we would have because they don't always think of the library as a place to kind of help with things sometimes and so you know for instance with this one we've been involved with the conversation of uh of setting up food pantries on two of our five campuses for the, on the perimeter side because of the food insecurity that our students are facing. And that's just kind of one of those things that just you are part of the holistic experience of the students and the library can play an important part in that. Um, I want to give you um, just a an example of really what I've been going through as far as leading through change um, since 2016. I can't believe it that we're still working through this. But um, in January 2015, uh, the Georgia Board of Regents announced the consolidation of Georgia Perimeter College and Georgia State University. So a two-year granting institution and a university. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of stress, anxiety, excitement as well that went along with that. Um, and at the time, I was just over the Dunwoody campus. So when we consolidated, and the slide right here just kind of gives you an idea of our student populations um, for the various institutions, whereas our downtown campus, Georgia State, big university, their demographics with 25% of their students were part-time, whereas our two-year institution, about 63% of our students were. And you can see the other things where, you know, our age um, percentage of students, 25 and older, was a little different. But as far as, like, first generation, our student to faculty ratio, they were close to similar in that. But one of the other things that was a big difference is that 19% of our students were enrolled only in online classes which kind of lends itself because a lot of our things are workplace development um, in addition to the associate's granting um, institution. So with this consolidation, though, it allows um, our students um, a more direct pipeline in case they wanted to uh, move on in their academic career and get a four-year degree. So some of the things that I had to manage um, with myself and the staff included, because a lot of things were happening and it seemed like they were happening fast. Um, so a new dean was announced for the libraries who was not part of either institution in January 2016. And that's when we were officially consolidating. That March, the new structure for perimeter was announced where we were now going to be under the dean um, and that our titles would change from library directors to now me being department head and those at each of the other campuses who were library directors are now um, associate department heads. So a little title shift, some responsibility shift too. Um, but mainly with that, it was titles. Um, I was promoted in April 2016 to department head after my then manager retired. Our technical services department that we had um, here at Georgia Perimeter was distributed because they consolidated that department, so we no longer needed it for um, on the Georgia perimeter side, which one of, goes to one of those hard decisions that we had to make, um, and then redistribute staff throughout the library. But fortunately, some people chose to, fortunately we didn't have to um, riff anyone or let anyone go. Some people chose to, and then others we were able to find other departments and positions for them to go to. I was able to hire associate department heads, then my faculty, my librarians had to go through a new evaluation and promotion process, which was very different 
than what we were currently on. Um, we announced that the way we had our part-timers, we found out was not, um, it wasn't uh, following processes and procedures that it needed to. So we were gonna have to let them go as of July of that 2017. And then on top of all of that, we switched from Voyager to Alma. Like we didn't have enough stress and anxiety and new responsibilities going on. So that's just kind of some of the things and leading through change and making those hard decisions, um, but still moving forward that I had to do. So I would say as far as advice to um, any of you that are listening, I would say apply your skills from previous experiences. I was one that didn't have a career prior to coming in. And I think sometimes people um, don't highlight what they've done in other things or either other associations or um, volunteer organizations and things like that. Seek out mentors. Sometimes mentors are for a season and not forever and that's okay. Um, I've participated in both formal mentoring um, programs and then also informal. And they both um, have benefited me at different times. Um, be introspective of yourself too as a leader, because as you develop and work on yourself, I think it helps with um, helping lead others. I recently just did the Strength Finders. Um, was fascinated at what my five top strengths they said I had. But one of the things was in what my five lower strengths were where I was like, oh yes, and this is why I depend on this person because they have that strength and can help me with that. And I would say look for opportunities to develop your skills, whether that's within professional associations, um, formal leadership institutes, or even at work. Our university has various uh, programs and things that we can participate in that I, I feel like sometimes we don't take advantage of like we, we could. So those are just kind of some of the things. Of course, depending on your situation and the type of environment you're in, um, there would be other things that I would suggest, but kind of overall, no matter what, I think these are some of the things that um, one should focus on. So I thank you for that formal part and um, would like to open it up to any questions that any of you may have. Well, thank you, Tamika. That was wonderful. Um, I've got two questions and I don't want to um, take up all the time from other people, but you have um, been very involved in the American Library Association. Yes. And if you could talk about your path through professional associations and the kinds of um, opportunities that people should take. Um, if we've got some current students and we have professionals here with us today, but if you could talk about um, what people need to do um, for networking and professional associations. And I also see that um, Deborah's put something in the chat as well. So I'll let her have the second question. Okay. So yeah, um, my, path has been probably from the very beginning when I was a student because I was um, part of the Spectrum Scholars Program. So I was part of that first cohort. And so being involved in something like that kind of exposed me to the association, I think, um, more than others initially have. Um, and so that kind of helped me pinpoint kind of where I wanted to be. I would say networking is key. Some of the committees and the um, projects I've been um, able to assist with has been because of just kind of being there and helping out and participating and then moving up into kind of leading those efforts. I think um, it can, you know, professional associations can kind of be what you make of it and how much you put into it. Um, right now, I know we are, have a, a situation in our hands that we're dealing with, but that's part of it and just kind of working and, and growing and, and learning um, with each other. I would say that um, 
you know, when those calls for volunteers come out, fill out those forms because we can't select people if they don't fill the information out. Um, and then also just kind of reach out to people who are in those roles to see how you can assist. Kind of much like I did with my, you know, first thing with uh, supervising graduate students and then, you know, moving into other things. It happens that way in the association too, when they're like, can I help? And then they see what to do and then also see your capabilities and your commitment and then willing to give you other things to do as well. Thank you. And I see t um, the Deborah's question was the same. We have oh, another okay. question over here in the chat um, saying, I want to pursue a leadership career track. I learned mm -hmm. I must be willing to seek out job opportunities, which will allow me to have supervisory leadership roles. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to address that, um, Tamika, and to maybe make a distinction on um, management versus leadership. That's something that we're talking about in our management course um, this week. Yeah. So if you look at that, and then the second one, I believe, um, I appreciated your comments about how to get supervisory experience when all the job announcements require it. Your strategy <laughs> of offering to assist your supervisor to obtain some of these skills was brilliant. So um, I'll let you respond to both of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, wanting to take that career track and knowing that sometimes is really beneficial too. Um, and then I would say also in those cases, and it kind of loops in with the, the job announcements saying that they weren't certain skills, and sometimes they're required and then sometimes they're desired. Um, and then what I found is that some people, if they don't meet all the desires, they also don't go for it. And I say, go for it. To me, you let them tell you no, you don't exclude yourself from the search from the beginning. Um, and then trying to make that first leap into it, I think that's when you really have to leverage kind of your past experiences. So, you know, maybe you haven't had the supervisory experience, but you led a group or a project within, you know, a sorority or a volunteer organization or things like that to show that you know kind of that process and how to motivate and get something done. Um, I would say like, and also in the cases with the professional association, I, that's where I got some of my budget experience that I could then have an example to talk about. Like we had to put on a program, we had X amount of money, and we had to stay within budget, or we, you know, sought out other resources to kind of supplement um, and then to kind of show that you are one that's willing to kind of look at other avenues and opportunities and, and be innovative in your approach, I think is one of those things. And the managing versus leading, I feel like with me, at the beginning, I feel like I was just truly just kind of managing, like really just kind of this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to approve time. I'm supposed to, you know, follow this HR process to hire people on. And, and I did it. Um, but now, as far as leading you within leadership, yes, you've got to still manage. But with the leadership, I just feel like it's opening up so much more. Like, you really have to be that visionary um, to help assist with um, – bring in forth um, what the, the plan is, whether it's your plan or the college president's plan or uh, the business owner's plan, no matter what the environment is in. Like you really have to think outside of your, your day to day in that leadership role. Um, and then with some, you know, some people just um, have it where leadership is you're inspiring others you know how to delegate, <laughs> you know, you know how to kind of um, work as a team um, to, to move that vision forward. And I think that's um, important as well. But it is hard. It is hard to that first getting your foot in the door for those leader, leadership positions can, can be a tough road. But I say uh, 
kind of just keep going for it and look for people who are willing to kind of help you in that process or provide you with some projects or things like that to, to add to your, your skill set along the way. Well, I know with some of our current students, they are coming in as career changers, um, but many of the students are coming straight from undergrad. And as you said, Tamika, um, any kind of a leadership role, whether it was in an extracurricular activity, if it was in academics, and um, I would encourage everybody to um, join student organizations now and they're looking for officers, that's one great way to um, mm -hmm. show your leadership, as well as through internships. Oh, so definitely. I think that there's some ways that you can get skills that can transfer into um, the skills that are needed in libraries. And I would say even those that, especially those that are coming, you know, second career and have those other experiences, actually doing an internship and working in the library can be very beneficial because it can tell you what you like and even things that you don't like as much. Um, and I know plenty of people who thought they were going to be, you know, all about technical services or whatever and had the experience in the internship and worked a reference desk and fell in love with that aspect or realized they really don't like teaching as much <laughs> as they thought they would. So it can work both ways to kind of help you um, experiment and figure it out now um, before moving forward into your permanent job. Does anybody else have any questions? You can either take the microphone or um, type something in chat. Um, you've got an expert here, uh, so take advantage of it. So, Tamika, this is Cheryl. Just while um, uh, we're waiting to see if anyone else has any questions, I have a quick one, Tamika, for you. Uh, and I'm not sure um, if I've got the wording right, but um, you've moved around to a number of different workplaces. So you've moved within those organizations, but also you've gone to new organizations. And I'm wondering if there are any um, characteristics or traits or things that you do specifically when you are new to an organization that uh, help you assert yourself as a leader, regardless of your position. So if there are things that you consciously or, or <laughs> unconsciously maybe ensure that you do right at the beginning when you're, uh, you know, people don't know you, they don't know your style yet, and things that you want to kind of um, portray to make, put people at ease uh, with your leadership style. Oh, excellent question. Um, one of the things that I have done at each kind of new uh, organization that I've gone to is really let them know that I need to listen first. Like I may have ideas coming in the door, but I really want to listen and understand both their, what they do in the organization more. Um, and so I would set up, I set up initial meetings with people when I first start um, and then also maybe like a month or so into it because as I learn things and have questions, I want to depend on them as the ex experts that have been going through this um, and use their, like I said, their talents and skills. So I've done that. Um, and then I've kind of also set up, whereas in some organizations, they didn't have regular meetings for them to kind of meet as a group. So I make sure to establish that as well. Sometimes our meetings are more just kind of idea sharing. And then other times it's been more kind of a formal structure of reporting out. Um, so it gives them a chance to kind of see that I'm willing to, to listen to them um, and solicit their ideas. I also feel like just kind of communicating various things to them up front, whether that's in those meetings and then following it up in email so that they know that, you know, I'm serious about certain things, um, like policies and procedures, we just have to follow um, and things like that. But there's flexibility and things like that. And I've also communicated with them, like, if they have a problem, something I've done, something that we're going through, to make sure that we have that dialogue. And I know that I can't be easy for some people like I said, depending on what their their relationship with their supervisors have been in the past, but 
also I know that sometimes I have to practice patience because it's going to take people, people change at different rates and realizing that um, has been um, beneficial to me as well. That's great. Um, and certainly those are uh, um, key points that you uh, showed that, you know, you kind of you really walk that uh, talk when you talked earlier about uh, making sure you have an open door and, you know, uh, disarming uh, that sort of um, people who always thought meetings were bad news only and, and changing the culture and the tone. So that's wonderful. And I think, in, um, you know, that, formal and informal communication, both sides of that are really important in terms of uh, making uh, people, demonstrating that you listen to them. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think we're, we're out of time, um, oh. but Thank you, Tamika, so much. Um, we really appreciate you taking time. Um, we know you're you're very busy with professional activities, um, with the associations, with your job, and um, the information that you've given here will be really valuable. We get lots of people who um, download the uh, the webinars, so uh, this will be spread widely. Um, Deborah or Cheryl, any last things? And I will sign off for now. Just to thank you so much for participating, Tamika. It was really wonderful. Enjoyed it. Um, and we're thrilled that you could uh, uh, take the time out for us at the uh, iSchool. Well, Deborah? I, I appreciate it very much. And my email is up there. And I put it up there for you to use. So please, if anybody thinks of some questions afterwards, feel free to reach out. Yeah, I just want to echo what both Sue and uh, Cheryl have said to me. Thank you so much. I, I'm really excited to share this with uh, my students. I think that a lot of what you said will uh, be inspirational and sort of give them an idea of just how realistic these jobs are and how exciting they can be. So thank you very much.